I'm from Brazil. Uh, and I've been working for the past, I don't know, two decades, uh, following closely the unfolding of the global environmental governance agenda. And I've been very privileged to be able to participate in person in the process regarding biodiversity negotiations and especially the climate COPs, which I've attended all of them since 2008, uh, the COPs and the technical negotiations that happen uh, in, in, in May, June every year. I've developed over those years a critique that is based on following social movements on the ground, which um, I participate and I'm joined uh, in Brazil and in Latin America, but also from uh, researchers' um, point of view. If we are seriously to understand what is going on and not going naively with movements that, from my point of view, uh, are much more <laughs> aligned to social engineering of, you know, uh, 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 manufacturing consent for the for the um, the power structures that are coming our way, we have to understand how it all started. It's important for us to have a clear moment in time when there was a big shift, and the complexity of climate was reduced to this carbon uh, monocultural narrative. On November 8, 1989, Thatcher. Uh, goes to the UN General Assembly and gives a full 33-minute speech about carbon dioxide, our common enemy. This is a very key moment because she states a programmatic view of how we need to move over the Cold War paradigm and framework and to face a common threat to all humanity. Uh, it's not coincidence that the next day, November 9th, 1889, it's the day that the Berlin Wall falls. So this is quite a, a timing event for us to understand that there was a shift. And within three years, 1991-92, we had this big multilateral meeting in Rio de Janeiro where the major environmental multilateral conventions were signed. So the entire governing the climate idea was born there in this moment of shifting from Cold War to the global warming era uh, and uh, has been over those, all those years very instrumental to actually co-opt, in my view, what was the genuine and authentic environmental movement and ecological critique of capitalism to be incorporated into this new transgenic version of the environmental movement, which is the market-based environmentalism. is this kind of activism that sees no problem in sitting with the people from Wall Street, with the big corporations, and actually they cannot conceive any more um, political activism uh, within the boundaries of the nation state and uh, its um, representations at province level or at city level. They actually, it's a new generation of activists, of, of human beings that are born, you know, have, uh, as they are digital natives, they also understand that we now live in a multi-stakeholder uh, world where it's not more United Nations, you know, the order that we, we've come to know since the end of the World War II, but it's now we are morphing into this new way of governance where corporations have the same or more say and power than the very nation states. So in this sense, I think we have to thread carefully into the whole localization movement, which I support strongly, but to understand that we are in a moment in time where fragile nation states are being absorbed, uh, incorporated under much powerful forces that are um, um, geographically uh, 
redefining and controlling uh, the earth. So I think we cannot use um, the localization argument to weaken uh, the boundaries that uh, and the constitutional powers that we, we still have and the election power that we still have, for instance, to resist uh, trade agreements. No, because trade agreements, uh, by definition so far, they are signed between nation states. We've seen more and more bilateral trade agreements between mega cities, cities that have the procurement power like uh, uh, Sao Paulo or um, Mexico City uh, or Mumbai, because they can buy big technological packages. Sometimes they have more money than small um, uh, African nation states, but this is not an argument to just uh, take out of our a world view, um, a clear picture of what is going on. And if I could summarize like in three uh, main forces that are converging together is the decarbonization process that is supposed to lead us to net zero, whatever that means <laughs> in practice by mid-century. With the digital transformation that is uh, in super fast pace since, uh, especially since the, the pandemic and as a response strategy through the green, the green deals. But uh, this idea that we can fully electrify the world economy by 2030. And this is supposed to be financed through the emission of new bonds or the issuance of new bonds, especially green bonds, but most of all, um, choosing as the, the most important path towards this green, low carbon, net zero future, a wild financialization of nature, bringing uh, natural capital into the financial market. Mm -hmm. So creating carbon credits, uh, water bonds, biodiversity offset, biodiversity you know, uh, um, schemes. But also, and that's something that really worries me, is the human capital uh, impact uh, market. You know, we, we are in the merge of issuing bonds out of performance of humans themselves. I see um, ver a very complex scenario where people that are, that are apologetic of blockchaining everything and of creating a cashless society through local monies and tokenize the economy, can um, come together with the localization debate and they can seem very local, but uh, we cannot be mistaken because uh, when you talk about blockchaining or hyper-connecting the future or putting sensors and drones everywhere, you know, to have this, this uh, uh, connectivity and fluence, we are always referring to the mothership. <laughs> the mothership is the new constellations of, you know, satellites and, and the, the new layer, uh, protocol layer of control that is upon us. We operate in uh, this Westphalian uh, order that since the 17th century was forged, you know, this idea of nation state. But if you look at the human history, nation states and you know, some are very um, young nation states. It's in a, in, a, in a with a broader view. You know, it's a very short human experience of how to govern. You know, huge populations and you know solve problems. You know, of infrastructures of food. The larger experience has been with empires. You no, know? so uh, I'm afraid to say that we are seeing uh, in a very fast paced way the uh, overcoming of this Westphalian world order based on this United Nations, because again, even the United Nations per se, it's what, 75 years old. It's really, uh, it's a child within the world history. But uh, I'm afraid we're walking towards empire, a new forms of empire that looks much more like uh, empire, empire, bu empire building that uh, now has the digital tools to assert itself. Uh, and I see very complicated um, way of, um, or very challenging, you know, for the lack of <laughs> vocabulary, um, how we are addressing, you know, this 
next 20 years, let's say, next, because uh, I just heard about, oh, we need to tax strongly the states that are not complying with the carbon, you know, uh, reduction demands. But look, I mean, the, the, the carbon border tax adjustment mechanism proposed by the EU actually is to create a non-commercial barrier to import exports and to demand that countries that want to sell to the EU adopt the new technology that can actually make carbon and everything else visible to the system. So I'm going to give a very uh, concrete example. Brazil is a big um, agribusiness exporter. To sell to the EU, it has to track and trace to prove that is deforestation free. Very noble, no? You can say on the ground, what you see, it's drones, it's sensors. It, the cat is the cattle using the earring that is monitored, you know, uh, by the satellite. It's, um, it's a complete surveillance scheme lots of technology, lots of intellectual property rights and softwares and work for experts from the EU to actually monitor and control something so we can sell. So uh, it's kind of, we have to look more closely to how the trade agenda, it's now being operated through the climate commitment. Industrialization in the, in the first world has moved to China. I think it's extremely hypocritic to say the emissions from China. No, China is the factory of the world, so it emits there, so you can have the consumption and the clean air, you know, that you have in Europe and the US, and for the elites in the South uh, too. The future is looking green in the sense of, you know, the, the, the control, uh, the techno control, the, the cloud providers, you know, when even, I don't know, the Pentagon has to make a, a procurement to see who is going to provide, you know, data storage for, for itself. There is no such a thing as a neutral technology, always a toolbox, or I use it. No, no, no. It's, I mean, you embody a worldview when you create a tool. You know, and the tool has a purpose not to, uh, it's not science, you are not just speculating to know the world, you are creating something uh, with, with which you can act upon the world. You know? So um, if you look at the origins of the, the main uh, technological matrix that we are under, you know, the whole dig digitalization process and even the, the internet, um, it is, has its root uh, its roots on a military project, the ARPANET, you know, to connect. But most of all, um, it it has an address. I mean, it 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 didn't uh, appear um, all over the world at the same time as like this collective brain and this co-evolving thing and this uh, uh, how did the guy call it this morphic field or whatever. No, it is a part uh, of this. Uh, California ideology. This is the term that uh, the scholars call it. But uh, within mostly Stanford and how it was financed also by the military. But um, I think we should not forget about uh, the crazy technological ideas that were imported from Europe with the paperclip operation when at the end of the World War II, there was a um, 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 retrieval of more than 500 uh, scientists you know, from Nazi Germany with their families that were brought to the US to develop the, the rocket, um, uh, the, uh, I mean, the whole rocket science and the uh, aerospace uh, investigation. This is a well-documented, you know, we have many scholars book, I mean, the, the declassified now documents. We have a cast today in our world of technocrats that have no um, allegiance to any nation state in particular, that they are a global class of, you know, experts that work for the private sector, then they go to the university, then they have a consultancy, then at some point they have an NGO, but they circulate, they intermarry, <laughs> And they forge this, like, the view. Um, it's a very cybernetic view 
of uh, how where humanity is going. And um, I'm afraid that uh, for this kind of people that are very green, at least in how they speak of, it's a perverted kind of green because it's a green uh, regarding this monocentric narrative of ultra reductionistic uh, narrative of carbon because it's a unity of reference that can be universal, universally fungible um, and supposedly is transparent, uh, it's quantifiable. Uh, we are now, um, um, we speak Carbonese nowadays, you know, it's like Latin that was the language of empire. Now we have the the Carbonese as the language of empire, and it serves to forge this uh, global culture that actually, and I've called this the epistemicide. You know, actually we are killing uh, all other languages or other narratives or in other systems of knowledge to refer to nature and to the ecological uh, challenges that we have because we are monofocused on this quantitative, that is not qualitative, uh, carbon view of the world. My vision for the future is very clear. It's either you are going to a human future, a human affirming future, or you are taking the transhuman path. They are. There is no, I mean, it's impossible to converge. It's impossible to compromise. I don't see how we can uh, discuss seriously, oh, this sovereign AI or this AI for good or this AI for localization. No, the same way blockchain, it's blockchain. The name says itself, you know, we have to place technology and the the technocratic system and the and the digital prism 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 uh, that is falling upon us and we have to face it um, uh, courageously and say it as it is. I remember that the anti globalization IFG forum that Elena was one of the founder. They had very clear the vision of where technocracy and technology was leading us. And I think uh, this is a challenge with the new generations, especially with the digital natives one, because they were born in a world where, you know, the digitalization, the internet is everywhere. But I don't want to move forward in, with the localization agenda if this needs to be merged with the internet of bodies. Uh, uh, program and the uh, digital ID and you know all the all the the new forms of control that are becoming current on our everyday. So I think this would be my uh, strong point. You know that there is no way that you can dance with robots uh, and glamorize. You know those hominids. Uh, you know new beings that are being created and at the same time pretend to be regenerating uh, nature and relocalizing.